أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل ورسلا لم نقصصهم عليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد We are continuing in our series uh, of the stories of the prophets and we are still in the story of the prophet Nuh عليه السلام and uh, I'm still um, uh, reconstructing what we know of the story of Nuh عليه السلام and uh, as I explained to you a few uh, lessons ago there's going to be a little bit of repetition by the nature of this content because my goal really is to have a very, very thorough uh, series and I'm not um, uh, restricting myself to any timeline or anything. I'm just going where uh, the flow goes as the saying goes. So today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to do in a little bit more analysis uh, what we learn from the Quran regarding the da'wah, the, uh, the teachings of the Prophet Nuh. What exactly was he calling his people to? What can we learn about his people from what he was calling them to do? And what was the response of his people? And how did the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam deal with that response? So uh, today's uh, lecture will be very much Quran focused and we will try to uh, uh, mention the verses of the Quran that talk about the methodology and the content of the da'wah of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam that mention what his people responded and how the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam responded to them back in return. And throughout all of this, what you will see over and over again is that the exact same, uh, the exact same criticisms that the people of Nuh gave were the criticisms that the Quraysh give of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is as if Allah Azza wa Jal is using the story of the Prophet Nuh Alaihi Salam to send a message to the Quraysh that the very first nation used the exact same things and said the exact same uh, uh, points that you are mentioning, O Quraysh. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is being given consolation as well, that Ya Rasulullah, it's not the first time that these issues have been raised. It's not the first time that the character of the messenger has been mocked, that the character of the followers has been mocked, that the socioeconomic differences are brought up. It's the same story over and over again. Frankly, for us now, 1,450 years later, the exact same issues really are brought up. And this notion of superiority complex against the Muslim Ummah and the socioeconomic privilege status as we're gonna see, uh, and the notion that those who follow religion are you know, intellectually backward. The same motifs that the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam had to hear, Allah knows how many years ago we are hearing to this day. It's the same notion, this assumption of superiority simply because they have more wealth or they have more status or they have whatever they think they have and they make fun of those who have the religion. So we're gonna see over and over again uh, the same cyclical patterns from the time of the Prophet Nuh throughout the iterations. By the way, even Fir'aun and Musa, the same, you know, the same notions are there throughout the majority of prophets to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all the way down to our time. So let us begin with one of the uh, verses that the Prophet Nuh Alaihi Wasallam has described in the Quran. That Allah says in the Quran, what is the Prophet Nuh calling to? Surah Al A'raf, verse 59. That, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ إِنِّي فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمِ فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهِ غَيْرُهُ إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, we sent Nuh to his people. And he said, O oh my people, اُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُهُ Worship Allah, you have no other God besides Him. I truly fear for you the torment of a tremendous day, of a frightening day. So we learn from here that all three motifs of religion are combined. Risala, Tawheed, and Akhirah. These are the three foundational premises of our faith. That there is one God, 
that this God sends prophets throughout mankind and that there is a final day. And this one verse combines all three of these motifs, that indeed we sent Nuh to his people and he said this is Risala. O oh my people, worship Allah, you have no God besides him. This is Tawheed. Inni akhafu alaykum adhaba yawmin azim. I'm fearful for you of the torment of a tremendous day. This is the Akhirah. And in Surah Hud 25 to 26, Allah says in the Quran, that uh, that we sent Nuh to his people. Inni lakum nadhirum mubin. Aniabudullah wa taquhu. That you should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. You should worship Allah alone and have taqwa of him. Truly I fear for you the torment of a painful day. The same notion that have the uh, fear, uh, the taqwa of Allah, have the worship of Allah, do the worship of Allah, and have the taqwa of Allah as well. So we have this notion of consciousness of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the beginning of Surah Nuh, we have the same uh, motif as well. That, inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi, inni lakum nadhirun mubin. That we sent Nuh to his people. Uh, and uh, Nuh said to, to his people that I am a nadhir, I am an open warner to you. Nuh said to his people, qala, uh, qala Nuh, Nuh said to his people that, O oh my people, I have been sent to you with a clear warning. Worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Ani'budullaha wa attaquuhu wa at Worship Allah alone. Have taqwa of him and obey me. If you do so, يغفر لكم ذنوبكم. He will forgive your sins. ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى. And he will delay your punishment. He will he will allow you to live until that a, ti a time will come, which is the appointed time of the day of judgment. And indeed, when that time comes, then it cannot be delayed if you only knew. So once again, we have all of these notions, but a little bit more as well. The concept of taqwa is mentioned here, and the concept of obeying the Prophet is also mentioned. And of course, obedience to the Prophet is a standard message of all of the uh, messengers. In Surah Shura, verse 13, the same notions are mentioned as well. That Allah says in the Quran, that شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا Allah has ordained for you, Ya Rasulullah, and for the believers, the same thing that he ordained for Nuh, and what he revealed to you, Ya Rasulullah, and what he revealed to Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. So the message is the same. What is that message? أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه Uphold the religion, establish the religion, and do not divide amongst yourselves in it. Establish the religion and make no divisions within the religion. Stick one within the ummah. So Allah is saying of the things we commanded Nuh alayhi salam, an aqimu deen, to make iqamat al deen. What is iqamat al deen? Iqamat al deen means to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to uphold the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. And and beyond your life as much as you can. The concept of Iqamat al deen primarily means that in your own personal life, you establish and you fulfill the rights of Allah and the rights of the ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're able to go beyond this, well then do that as well, meaning beyond your personal life. Uh, I, I say this because the concept of Iqamat al deen uh, some groups have taken on a, a, a political uh, establishment of this. And uh, while that is not 100% incorrect, it is also not the primary connotation of the verse again just to be technical here iqamat al deen is not necessarily in this verse i mean the establishment of a political order it actually primarily means to establish the deen in your own life and this is demonstrated in the uh, uh, prophetic realities of the majority of prophets who did not establish political enterprises and yet they did establish iqamat al deen so this shows us when allah says iqamat al deen he is not primarily talking about the establishment of a political land and I say this simply because to be fair to this verse here uh, of course the reality of Islamic political science is beyond the scope of today's uh, lecture uh, it is good to have uh, uh, an Islamic political system but it is not the primary purpose of our faith uh, it is an incidental if you have it it's good if not then well then you can still enter Jannah by perfecting the religion in your own uh, life so uh, just to make that uh, small point of Iqamat al deen here in Surah Al-Mu'minun verse 23 Allah says that uh, indeed لقد أرسلنا نوحا إلى قومه فقال يا قوم اعبدوا الله ما لكم من إله غيره أفلا تتقون again the same concept that we sent Nuh to his people 
and he declared to his people, O oh my people, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. You have no other God besides him. Will you not have taqwa of him? Now, from all of this, we learn a number of things. There's a lot of repetition in these verses. Some of them give more than others, but the concept is the same. It is very clear that the people of Nuh worshipped multiple gods. We know this without a shadow of a doubt. And it also appears to be the case that they either rejected Allah or, or they neglected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that in reality it was as if they did not believe in him. And this is somewhat akin to the reality of the Quraysh. The Quraysh knew the name Allah but they made Allah so distant from their lives that they rarely worshipped Him. They did not invoke Him. They did not make dua to Him. They would make dua to the intermediaries. And they would say to these intermediaries that you will be our conduit to reach Allah, the grand God, the big God. And we're going to go through all of these minor gods to get to the ultimate God. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They knew who Allah was, but they rarely invoked Him. It was was only in a matter of life and death when they're about to drown when they when they when every hope is lost they will then invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala otherwise the general default is that they would not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly so it appears that the people of Nuh had fallen into a similar type of idolatry a similar type of paganism and this is the reality of global paganism from the beginning of time up until our times it's not they that they reject the existence of one all-powerful God. It is rather they make this one God too distant, too holy, too unapproachable. They make that one God so blessed, if you like, and so distant from the world that it is as if his existence doesn't have a role to play in our lives. And therefore, Nuh alayhi salam is coming and reminding them that Allah Azza wa Jal is not a distant God. Allah Azza wa Jal is not someone who is too above you. No, in fact, there is no other God at all that you should be going through to reach Him except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is also clear from these verses that the people of Nuh did not believe in a hereafter and they had rejected Qiyamah. And so once again, similar to the Quraysh, that the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is reminding them that there's going to be a resurrection and they should prepare for that uh, res uh, resurrection. And we clearly see this linkage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the concept of worship and the reminding of the people of Nuh of the existence of Allah in the famous Surat of Nuh. That the, the Prophet Nuh says in Surah An-Nuh that مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارًا وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا Notice, what is the matter with you that you are not in awe of Allah Azza wa Jal? Even though Allah is the one who has created you in stages. أَلَمْ تَرَوْ كَيْفَ خَلَقَ اللَّهُ سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا Don't you see how Allah has created the seven heavens one after the other? وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا And he has placed the moon within it as a light. وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا And he has made the sun a radiant lamp. وَاللَّهُ أَنْبَتَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ نَبَاتًا And Allah has caused you to grow forth like the plant is growing from the earth. Allah has caused you to grow forth. ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهَا وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا Then he will return you to the earth and then bring you back from the earth. وَاللَّهُ جَعَلَ لَكُمْ الْأَرْضَ بِسَاطًا And Allah has spread forth the earth for you uh, uh, in a very flat manner so that you may walk along its spacious uh, pathways. Now, this entire paragraph is basic realities that are observed around us. And the Quran uses the same tactics against the Quraysh and against modern man as well. That look at the obvious signs of Allah around you. Don't you see the perfection of the creation? Don't you see the seven heavens above us? Seven heavens, we've explained this in many previous lectures. It is all of the uh, uh, the stars above, all of the creation above us. Uh, it is the celestial spheres and objects that uh, uh, Allah Azza wa says, look at all of this creation above us. And Allah has placed the moon, and Allah has placed the sun, and Allah Azza wa has caused you to go forth in stages, and to grow, and then to die. Then he shall resurrect you. Now, what is the first verse? 
Why are you not in awe of Allah? مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارَ Which means Allah Azza wa Jal had lost in their hearts the sanctity that He deserved. How could they have done this? The way that pagans do this, the way that polytheists do this, is that the main God, the primary God, becomes distant from the creation. He becomes too detached. And so it is as if the primary God plays no role in your life. In fact, as one of the Quraysh says to the other, and they're doing tawaf from the Kaaba, the one of the Quraysh asked the other, do you think Allah sees and knows us? Do you think Allah Azza wa Jal cares about our du'as? And the other one said, only if we shout out loud will Allah hear us. Otherwise, it's these gods that hear us. So what happens is that the primary God, in this case, Allah Azza wa Jal, becomes a God that has no direct relationship with you. And this is what happens with the people of Nuh. When that happens, well then, the love and the fear and the connection that the believer should have with Allah is taken away and it is replaced with the love and fear and connection with the false gods. And this is what Allah says about the uh, Quraysh. This is exactly what Allah says about the Quraysh. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when the other gods are mentioned, they become happy. When Allah is mentioned, they become distant. They're not connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah that those who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love their false gods as much as you love Allah, in fact, you love Allah more than they love their false gods. So this notion of connecting with the Creator, it is gone from the minds of the polytheists, from the modern polytheists, and from the Quraysh, and from the people of Nuh. And instead of this connection with Allah, the false connection occurs with their gods, the false gods, and that is why the Prophet Nuh is being uh, sent. So what were the tactics of the Prophet Nuh? Well, the Quran tells us many tactics. The Quran says, and again, this is in Surah Nuh, that the Quran mentions that, uh, قَالَ نُوحٌ رَبِّي uh, إِنِّي دَعُوتُ قَوْمِي لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا Nuh said, O oh my Rabb, I have called my people throughout the day and throughout the night. But, فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَاءِ إِلَّا فِرَارًا The more I called them, the more they turned away from me. وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ Every time I called them so that you may forgive them, جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ They put their fingers in their ears. وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ As a mockery, they covered themselves with their garments. They might have had a cloak, they might have something, and they're covering their uh, ears with their uh, garments. وَأَصَرُوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا استكبارا. And they persisted in denying me, and they acted very arrogantly. ثُمَّ إِنِّي دَعُوتُهُمْ جِهَارًا Then I called upon them publicly, openly, outwardly. ثُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْرَرْتُ لَهُمْ Then I preached to them privately. وَإِسْرَارًا uh, uh, And I preach to them in a manner that is sir or private. Eventually, Nuh alayhi salam lost patience with his people. And Nuh said, قَالَ نُوحُ الرَّبِّ إِنَّهُمْ عَصَوْنِي Nuh said, O oh my Lord, they have certainly persisted in disobeying me. And they followed instead their elite. They followed the creme de la creme of their society, whose abundant wealth and children only increased them in their sense of loss. وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّارًا And they devised a tremendous plot against me, urging their followers, telling their followers, do not abandon these false gods. So the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam says that he invoked his, he pro called to his people at different times, at different places, using different methodologies. He called them, as the Quran says, for a thousand years minus 50. As Allah says, this is very explicit. And again, by the way, this is a very uh, common misconception that Nuh lived for 950 years. No. Nuh lived for longer than 950 years. Nuh alayhi salam preached for 950 years. And this is something that again,
again, we will have to accept at face value, as I have said multiple times throughout many of my lectures, that where the Quran is explicit, where the Sunnah is explicit, we hear and authentic, we hear and we obey, and we do not question. And where it is ambiguous or vague, or where there is room for asking questions, we may go ahead and ask and leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is unequivocal? We sami'na wa ta'na, hear and we obey. And there is again this modern notion of uh, trying to rationalize how can the Prophet Nuh have lived for 950 years? Well, the response is the one who created Nuh and the one who gave Nuh his organs and his body and whatnot is capable of allowing Nuh to live for 950 years. As we said in a previous lecture as well, there is no evidence that anybody else of the time of Nuh lived that long. There is no evidence that the earlier generations lived a thousand years, 200 years, 100 years. Uh, you know, this is uh, not something that we know. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I'm saying it's not a part of our uh, belief system to affirm so. If it happened, Allah is capable of doing it. And if it didn't happen, well then, we are not uh, obliged to believe in it. We're only obliged to believe in one Prophet's lengthy life, and that is the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, which is very explicit. فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا he lived amongst his people for 950 years, 1,000 minus 50, preaching to them. So he is preaching to his people for, 100, uh, for 950 years, and sometimes he's preaching publicly, and sometimes he's preaching privately, and sometimes he's telling the message in an entire audience in the middle of the town, and sometimes he's going to their houses and preaching one-on-one. -on -one. So the tactics varied. And so for 950 years, he's using all of these tactics. At times, he's encouraging people by enticing them to the blessings of Allah. So uh, in, in Surah Nuh, the Prophet Nuh says that if you embrace Islam, Allah will shower you with abundant rain. And Allah will increase you with wealth and children. And He will give you gardens and He will give you rivers. So this is a enticement tactic. If you believe that Allah will give you all of this as well. Sometimes He uses emotional argument. He says, Ya qawmi, O my people, inni akhafu alaykum adhaba yawmin azim. O my people, I am scared for you. I love you so much that I'm scared for you that if you don't believe, then a painful punishment will come. So he uses an emotional argument, a threat. Sometimes he uses the spiritual argument of forgiveness. I said to my people, seek Allah's forgiveness for indeed he is the one who forgives. So we see from this that the prophets and after them the preachers of Islam should use all of these tactics depending on which tactic will be the most effective. For some people, the tactic of enticement works. Believe in Allah and you will find happiness of the heart and that is very true. For other people, it is spiritual blessings and forgiveness. Believe in Allah and you will be pure. Your sins will be forgiven. And that is also true. For other people, it is threat of punishment. Believe in Allah for if you do not believe, then I fear that your arrogance will cause the punishment to come down. And this is the tactics that many of the prophets have used in the past. If you look at, again, the same motifs and tactics are there. Similarly, when you are preaching Islam, when you're teaching Islam, when you're interacting with others, you look at their own psychology and you see which tactic will be the most effective and all of these are legitimate because Allah created people differently and different things entice different people so the Prophet Nuh salam's methodology is something that is universal and we can benefit from up until our times as well so the Prophet Nuh therefore we also learn by the way of, of course the concept of private da'wah public da'wah secret da'wah one-on-one da'wah da'wah in audiences and crowds the Prophet did all of these things Again, I say, the story of Nuh alayhi salam is in reality almost a replica in terms of, what do I mean by this? In terms of what his people said and what he said to them and what his response was and how they mocked him. It is almost literally line by line, a replica of what is happening in Mecca with the Prophet sallallahu and the Quraysh. And of course, the message is obvious. And that is simultaneously a message to the Quraysh and a message to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As for the Quraysh, the message is, 
You are not the first. The very first ummah did exactly what you are doing. And notice what happened to them. I sent a flood to destroy them. There is no trace of them left. And as for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is being consoled that Ya Rasulullah, you are not the first to be denied. You are not the first to be mocked. And the same thing said to Nuh are being said to uh, you. So, uh, and of course, as I said, even to us, we can learn from all of these motifs because they are universal. How poor is man and how fragile is man that for millennia, the same arguments are used against the prophets of God. There is nothing new that they can come forth with. What was the response of Nuh alayhi salam and uh, the people's response to that as well? So uh, the people's response when Nuh was sent to them, Allah says, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ إِنَّا لَنَرَاكَ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينٍ The mala, who is the mala? The mala are the elite groups who control society. The mala are the gangs that think that they have power over everybody else and the other people have given them that power out of fear, out of love, out of greed. So the mala are the elite, or I should say they consider themselves the elite. And so Allah says, The The mala of those who disbelieved of his people said, we see you in manifest error. You are clearly wrong. We are right when we worship the false gods. We have society with us. We have history with us. We found our forefathers doing this. And so we must be correct. So we find the motif of Quantity means they are right. A bit of legacy means they are right, means we had a little bit before you. And socioeconomic privilege means we are right. So the fact that all of us are agreeing upon this, group mentality, mob mentality, means that you are wrong. In Surah Hud verse 27, Allah says in the Quran that, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ once again, the mala. Notice the mala is being mentioned multiple times. It is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the reality of the Quraysh because the Quraysh did the exact same thing. The Quraysh also had a mala. The chieftains of the Quraysh are acting exactly like the chieftains at the time of the Prophet Nuh. So in Surah Hud verse 27, listen to these series of uh, pr uh, of problems, the series of i'tiradat, the series of objections that they're raising for the Prophet Nuh. The disbelieving chiefs of his people said that uh, We clearly see that you are a human like us. So point number one, you are a human being. If Allah had wanted to, he would have sent an angel. Why should we follow you? Prophets are not men. Prophets are not human beings. You're, you're flesh and blood. We know who you are. You eat and drink, you marry, you have children. You are flesh and blood. How can you be a prophet? Point number two. وَمَا نَرَاكَ تَبَعَكَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَرَاذِلُونَ And we see that none of us elite follow you. Only the lowest class is following you. Point number two. Socioeconomic, nobility. If you look at your converts, O Nuh, your converts are the shepherds. Your converts are the poor, the weak, the downtrodden. The elite are not your followers. So truth is measured by the privilege of class of those who embrace it. Whatever the privilege class says becomes the truth. And subhanAllah, how Similar is our time frame. The elite and powerful, what they say becomes true. And anybody who doesn't agree with them, they are the backwards, they are the ones. And look at now, morality and the LGBT issue and the trans issue and all that is happening. Just because the elite, quote unquote, are saying it, the presumption, all of mankind must say it. And because they're not saying it, well then that makes them backward. Of course, this is a circular argument as you can uh, tell. So point number two, وَمَا نَرَاكَ تَبَعَكَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَرَاذِلُونَ That the people who are following you are the lowliest amongst us. Point number three, بَادِيَ الرَّأِي They are not intelligent. They are people who are quick to jump to anything. They are not the smartest amongst us. They don't have the Nobel Prizes and the PhDs and whatnot. بَادِيَ الرَّأِي And again, this is exactly how the Quraysh described the Muslims to the Negus, to the Najashi. Remember, when the Quraysh sent 
envoys to the Najashi. So they described the Muslims and they said, our low class, those that are not, you know, the sufaha of our, that's literally how they called the, the Muslims, the sufaha amongst us, the foolish people amongst us, and those that were not of the elite have embraced this man's faith. And the same notion applies in our times as well. Badi Rai. And then another uh, objection. وَمَا نَرَى لَكُمْ عَلَيْنَا مِنْ فَضْلٍ We do not see anything that makes you better than any of us. Notice all the time and to this day, we find people say, hey, if your religion was true, how come your GDP, how come Nobel Peace Prize winners, how come this and that? This is not how truth is measured. Truth has nothing to do with how much money you have in the bank. Truth has nothing to do with your GDP of the country, with the fact that uh, you have won a Nobel Prize for something or not. Truth is above these types of you know uh, modern wor uh, worldly privileges. And these are the same notions that the people of Nuh used to discredit Nuh alayhi salam. What makes you better than us? You are low class. You are not people of intelligence. That's what they thought. And you are human beings. Rather, we think that you are all a bunch of liars. And this is why from the beginning of the prophetic message, from the very beginning of the prophetic message, our Prophet is told to teach the people that there is no such thing as class. We don't have nobility just because you were born in a certain family. In akramakum, indallahi atqakum. If you really want to judge nobility, nobility is judged by your taqwa, by your manners, by your akhlaq, by your God fearingness, by your piety. So, this notion of class, this notion of judging truth based upon your group, group dynamics, please be aware of this reality. It is a constant struggle between truth and uh, falsehood. And in Surah Al-Mu'minun, we also find a similar uh, sentiment. That's, uh, قومه, those who disbelieved of his people, they said that, uh, He is only a human like you. He wants to be superior to you. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَأَنزَلَ مَلَائِكَةً If Allah had wanted to, He would have sent an angel down. مَا سَمِعْنَا بِهَذَا فِي أَبَائِنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ We have not heard anything like this in our previous forefathers. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا رَجْرٌ بِهِ جِنَّةً This is a man who has a madness. فَتَرَبَّصُوا بِهِ حَتَّى حِينَ Be patient with him until he dies or we take care of him in meaning a veiled threat to kill him. Now notice in Surah Al-Mu'minun, we find another objection and that is he wants to be superior to you. SubhanAllah, nothing could be further from the truth. None of the prophets is aiming for political glory. None of the prophets is aiming for superiority. But when you have a diseased heart, you will interpret even the most pure thing in the diseased manner. When you yourself are hungry for power, then when a pious person comes, there is no way for you to even understand piety. And you must analyze his piety in light of your corrupt heart. You cannot recognize purity when you see it. So when the prophets come and the prophets bring about positive change and they have followings, those who don't understand what piety is can only see, oh, this is a man who wants to be famous. The reality is the fame wants to, you guys want to be famous. The rejectors want to be famous. The prophets have no desires to be famous. But when your hearts are full of diseased, when you yourself are the problem, then when the solution comes, you put your problem onto the solution and you accuse the solution of having your very problem. Look at the utter irony of ironies. They wanted power. And when Nuh comes, they say, oh, Nuh wants power. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Now, here we are criticizing the people of Nuh. But dear Muslim, I remind myself and all of you, sometimes this happens to us too in our daily interactions with others. Sometimes we accuse others of what we ourselves are guilty of because we are too scared to look in the mirror and realize actually I am guilty of this thing, not my brother in Islam that I'm throwing it upon. So the, the, the chieftain said that يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَتَفَضَّلَ عَلَيْكُمْ He wants to be superior to you. And this is not of the beliefs of the believers. 
As for the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةُ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًّا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادًا The hereafter we give to those who do not desire to have ulu in this world. Their goal is not to have that level of superiority over the rest of mankind. They don't want to rule. They don't like being in the ruling class. That's not what the believer desires to do. The believer wants to live a pious life. The goal of the believer is not to become the king. It's not to become you know, the, the establishment and the elites of society. The goal of the believer is the pleasure of Allah. And it is the goal of those who reject Allah Azza wa Jal to be powerful in this, in this world. إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ Fir'aun had ulu in this earth. That's what he wanted. Fir'aun had mightiness and power in this world. That's what he wanted. And he got it in this world, but he got nothing in the hereafter. So the people of Nuh said, يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَتَفَضَّلَ عَلَيْكُمْ He wants to be superior to you. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَأَنزَلَ مَلَائِكَ If Allah had really wanted to send a prophet, He would have sent an angel instead of a man. So we get to the same motif of who are you to be a prophet unto us? The same thing that the Quraysh said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why Allah says in the Quran that we have not sent anyone before you except that he was a bashar, except that he was a rajul. We have only sent before you men whom we inspired, inspired with the revelations. Allah has never sent an angel. And Allah says, even if I did send an angel, he would look like a man and he would dress like a man. And he would talk like a man, so you would think he is a man. If I were to send an angel, he would have to come in the shape of a man. How else would you see him? And he would have to be dressed like you, so you would think he is a man. But I don't send angels, I send actual human beings. So, and then the third thing they accused him of, that in huwa illa rajulun bihi jinnah. He is a man who is insane, who has a madness. And this is exactly what they accused the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of as well, that this is a man who has a madness. And so Allah says that, مَا بِصَاحِبِكُمْ مِنْ جِنَّةِ Your companion is not mad. Your companion is not possessed by uh, so, uh, 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 some type of madness. The same connotation, because they could not understand or rationalize why the Prophets would be preaching this bizarre message to, to their eyes, radical message, and to not get anything in return. To this day, dear brothers and sisters, those who study Islam and reject it are perplexed as to why the Prophet ﷺ would do what he was doing. What was his motivation? He clearly did not want money. He was not interested in fame. He was not doing it to live a privileged lifestyle. So what was his motivation? So then he must have had some type of hallucination. He, he believed himself to be a prophet. He must have been seeing visions and whatnot. He was, you know, uh, you know uh, he had some type of mental issues. Allah. That's what they say. But that's exactly what Allah is saying. The people of Nuh said that he must be a madman. So be patient until we rid of, get rid of him or he dies a natural death. The Prophet Nuh as the Quran tells us, responded to all of these. And the Prophet Nuh defended not just himself but his followers because one of the things that they demanded of the Prophet Nuh is that he rid himself of his low class followers. They demanded that they did not want to see the riffraff, the rough, according to them, of course, according to us, the, these are the righteous. That they said to the Prophet Nuh, get rid of your followers. And this is exactly what the Quraysh said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. So Allah says, Surah Hud verse 29, that, وَمَا أَنَا بِطَارِدِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا I shall never dismiss the believers. I shall never get rid of them. إِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ they are going to meet Allah. Allah will reward them. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ قَوْمٌ تَجْهَلُونَ But uh, you are a people who are acting uh, ignorantly. وَيَا قَوْمِ مَنْ يَنْصُرُنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ إِنْ تَرَدْتُهُمْ O my people, if I were to get rid of them, who would protect me against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I will never get rid of them. So the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam said to his people, these are my followers. If you don't like it, then you leave. I'm not going to leave my followers. And this is exactly what Allah told our own Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam multiple times. Surah Al-An'am and Surah Al-Kahf. 
وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ الْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي Do not expel from your gatherings the righteous who are calling upon their Lord morning and night. Allah says in the Quran, فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ If you get rid of them, then you, Ya Rasulullah, will be amongst the ظَالِمِينَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ Ya Rasulullah, keep with the righteous and ignore the arrogant. What is Abasa wa Tawalla and Jawal Ahma? Wa ma dhrika al-Allahu yazzakka aw yadhakkaru fa tanfa'u dhikra amma man istaghna fa anta lahu tasadda Notice the whole surah is the same motif that the Quraysh demanded the Prophet to get rid of the lowly. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says, no, they are not the lowly. These are your people that you need to be around. And Allah says, that, وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ Do not avert your gaze from this batch of people onto those people to ridu zinat al hayat dunya that you think will give you the blessings of this world. No, your gaze must be upon the uh, righteous. And when they accuse the Prophet Nuh of being a human, and not being an angel, he said, I am indeed a human. He says, I never said I was an angel. This is in the Quran. I never said I'm anything but human. What type of accusation is this? I'm telling you I'm a human being. I never claim to possess all of the treasures of Allah. I never claim to know the knowledge of the unseen. And I never said I am an angel. And as for this issue of wealth, Nuh was very clear. وَيَا قَوْمِ لَا أَسَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مَا لَا إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ Oh my people, I'm not asking you for any money. Don't think that I'm here for any power, any type of monetary compensation. My reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows us, brothers and sisters, that when the honor of the prophets is attacked, the prophets must respond back. And when they are not there to respond, we should respond on their behalf because an accusation against the prophets of Allah is an accus accusation against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So notice, the people of Nuh objected to the message of Nuh and they made fun of him. And they said he's a madman. And they said he has to have political ambitions. And they said this and they said that. And he said, how can he be a human being? And the prophet Nuh deconstructed and dismantled every one of their arguments in a very logical and rational manner. And he defended the core of his message. When all of this failed, what did the people of Nuh do? They did what every single tyrannical regime since the beginning of time does. Every single volume, every single tyrant, every single evil force. When you cannot get what you want by virtue of your argument, you resort to force, you resort to threats, you resort to violence. And that's exactly what the people of Nuh said. They said, Surah Al-Shu'ara verse 116, that, If you don't stop, O Nuh, then we shall stone you to death. This is always the tactic of the tyrant. The same motif of Nimrud and Fir'aun. The same motif of uh, 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 Nimrud and sorry, Nimrud and Ibrahim. The same motif of Fir'aun and Musa. The exact same thing. The same concept. If you don't accept, we're going to kill you. If you don't accept, we're going to eliminate you. That's not the way of the believer. That's not the way. When when you have truth on your side, you do not need to resort to violence. You do not need to kill the person who rejects the truth. Present the truth and then leave their affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you don't have the truth, when Allah is not on your side, well then, you must resort to violence. Now, what did the Prophet Nuh do when they resorted to violence? The Prophet Nuh said, bring your threat, do what you can. I have Allah, you have false gods. The Prophet Nuh said to them, do what you want. I leave you open, I challenge you back. If you think you can harm me without Allah's permission, then go and do what you want. Surah Yunus, verse 71 to 72. That, what do Alayhim Naba Relate to them, Ya Rasulullah, the story of Nuh. When Nuh said to his people, Ya Qawmi, in kana kabur alaykum maqami wa tadkiri bi ayatillah. O my people, if my presence and my reminding you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are too much for you to bear, if you don't like them, then know one thing. فَإِنِّي تَوَكَّلْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ رَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ I have put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have my yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, 
Nuh says to his people, فَأَجْمِعُ أَمْرَكُمْ Go and devise your plot, right? You and your shuraka, you and your false gods, ثُمَّ كِيدُونِي And then plot and, and, and have your secret plot against me. وَلَا تُنْذِرُونَ Don't even wait to carry it out. It's a veiled threat back at them. Don't even wait and delay. Go ahead and plot and plan and call upon your false gods and see if they can harm me. In ajriya illa ala Allah. My reward is with Allah. Allah will take care of me. المسلمين, and I have been commanded to be of those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the way, it is very clear that the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam has, is losing, he's exasperated, and he has every right to be exasperated after 950 years of preaching to his people. He becomes frustrated and he says to them, you're threatening me? Then I am telling you, go and do what you want. Gather your mobs. Secretly plot and plan. Call upon your false gods. But I have Allah on my side. And notice, this is the way of the believer. The believer has so much confidence, has so much iman, that when the entire society threatens, the believer says, do as you please. I have Allah. And if Allah has not willed, it is never going to happen. And if Allah has willed, then you can do nothing more or less than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed. And so when the people threaten to kill him and when the people threaten to uh, exterminate him, that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Nuh, as we see in the Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يُؤْمِنَ مِنْ قَوْمِكَ إِلَّا مَنْ قَدْ آمَنْ Allah revealed to the Prophet Nuh, after 950 years, Allah said to the Prophet Nuh, none of your people will believe anymore, except for those who have already believed. فَلَا تَبْتَئِسْ Don't become distressed about what they are doing. Don't be worried now. That's it. Stop having this level of stress. Don't stress out. Build the ark, construct the ark under our watchful eyes and our directions. We'll tell you how to build an ark. The Prophet Nuh did not live next to a river. There was no ocean in front of him. And as we're gonna come to in our next class, it is very, very likely that no major ship had been built before the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And so Allah says to the Prophet Nuh, there's no point anymore, stop preaching. Your people are not gonna believe, except for those who have already believed. So now the time has come to move on to the next stage. What is the next stage? I am telling you, O Nuh, to build a massive ark. And I know you don't know how to build a ship, we will tell you how to build a ship. We will monitor that you are building it properly. We're gonna make sure that you're following our directions and you do it down to the proper manner and it's going to be done according to our wahi. And O Nuh, I have one command for you, O Nuh. Do not dare argue back with me for those that have done injustice and wrong surely they are going to be drowned. Now, Allah informed the Prophet Nuh from day one, O oh Nuh, the people who have rejected you, they're going to drown. And I have one command upon you, O oh Nuh, do not come back to me and ask me why they have drowned. That's not for you to ask. We're gonna see, of course, that the Prophet Nuh slipped up in one regard, and we're gonna get to this point uh, in our next few lessons uh, after this. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Nuh that now the time of preaching was done and you have to move on to the next phase and that is the building of the ark and that will inshallah ta'ala be our next lesson. What is the ark? Who was on the ark? Uh, what was the notion of the flood? Was it a global flood? Was it a regional flood? Did it destroy all of mankind? Did it only destroy one city or village? What do we know about such a major flood from our uh, other history uh, texts and from other archeological evidence? What can we know about this from uh, other mechanisms and sources of knowledge? And uh, how did Allah Azza wa Jal save the Prophet Nuh? And who was saved on that uh, ark? All of this inshallah ta'ala will be continuing from next week. Uh, we have come to the conclusion of today's episode. Until next time, Jazakumullah khairan. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي 
أما استحييت تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب